The directive by the federal government to telcos is fully implemented. Millions of Nigerians who are yet to register and link their NIN to their SIM will not be able to use their lines to make calls anymore. The government's directive was announced in a joint statement signed earlier today by the Director of Public Affairs at the Nigerian Communications Commission, Ikechuku Atende, and Head of Corporate Communications at the National Identity Management Commission, Kaudi Adegoke. Over 125 million SIMs, according to the statement, have had their NINNs submitted for linkage, verification and authentication. And NIMC has issued over 78 million unique NINs to date. The government explained that NIN SIM linkage had been extended on multiple occasions to allow Nigerians freely comply with the policy. It added that the enrollment of the NIN was a continuous exercise as it was a precondition for service and telecommunication companies, banks, Nigerian Immigration Service and several other government agencies. According to the NCC, at least 72.8 million subscribers risk being disconnected from telecommunication services following the latest directive. Exactly one week ago, an Abuja Kaduna bound train was attacked by terrorists. And on that fateful day, many passengers were killed, others injured, and scores kidnapped. Now, barely a week after that incident, uh, repair works are still ongoing. But what Kaduna residents are demanding now is government tackling surge of terrorism that has since ravaged the state. Lupe Assam has details. It's about a week since the shocking attack on the Kaduna-bound train by terrorists who also opened fire on passengers. The NRC said 362 persons were documented to have boarded the train, while Kaduna government confirmed that eight of them died. Injured survivors were evacuated to hospitals, and dozens of them have been discharged. For now, over 150 persons are yet to be found, going by statements by the NRC. President Buhari described the incident as a callous attack. And the vice president, during his visit to victims, explained that the terrorists are cowards only out to cause fear. The president later issued directives that the military ruthlessly deal with terrorists and rescue those kidnapped. But seven days after, the victims still languish in unknown destinations with their abductors. Their loved ones now panic, especially after some of them received calls from the terrorists. Till today, train services remain suspended by the NRC. In a later statement, it confirmed that at least seven coaches have been repaired, re-railed, and moved to NRC stations. Some people who spoke to us are yet to recover from the shock of the attack. One of the victims promised never to use the train again. Others still consider it a safer alternative and can't wait for train services to resume. It will be safe this time around because I believe the present administration, the government, have learned a lesson in terms of uh, uh, insecurity. Therefore, I hope that they will do something about the security issue and uh, people will now have a free mind to come to the railway station and get a ticket to Abuja or beyond Abuja. The government should do more than just fixing the train. Because if you fix it, there's possibility the attackers might still come again. But when you fix the, tra the train and then you, you address the security challenges by maybe uh, tracing the bandits, their hideout, and increasing security in the police station and every other thing there, I believe people will be comfortable with it. The recent surge in terrorism has come as a rude shock to Governor Nasir Arifai. And on Thursday, he called for extreme actions against bandits who he believe now partner Boko Haram. Despite ongoing operations, security agencies have been called out for failure to stem the surge of banditry. The Inspector General of Police on Saturday deployed additional troops to the Kaduna Abuja Highway. The military are also enhancing their troops to effectively tackle threats. Armies world over continually engage in training and capacity building to enable them to surmount emerging security challenges. At least 64 numbers on the manifest are non existent according to the NRC's latest statements. There are claims that despite checks to ensure all passengers boarding the train go in with tickets, many still do so without them. This has given rise to fears that if that was the case on the 28th of March, then more than 362 persons were actually on that train. And this again suggests that way more than 162 persons are currently missing and could probably have been kidnapped by the terrorists. Lupe Assam, 
TVC News, Kaduna. Security expert Febi Aratokwale joins me live in the studio for more on this development. What do you make of government's response at this time? Particularly, do we know the number of people that have been abducted on that train? Um, Femi, you see, thank you for having me and good evening, Nigerians. This is a very sad situation when we look at the situation with insecurity, journey management with our roads, air, and you know, the way we travel and the way we do business. It shows that the government are concerned, but I think they are kind of like, you know, a little bit out of touch, out of ideas, because the real people plying all these roads, going on the train, are the common citizens. Yeah. Now, um, I think some hours before the train attack, I was in your studio here and still talking about the air, I mean the, 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 the airport attack. And the next thing, I personally said it, that the airport attack happens to be a test. And barely 24 hours, the train attack happened. Even up till now, are you trying to tell me that the rail and everything is safe right now? No, it's not yet safe. Then that simply means we need to do more. And the governor of Cardinal, I mean, he, he said the right thing. We need to do more. The government must do and act fast. But are they acting fast is the question. It's not just about, you know, briefing or giving interviews, but again, it's about let us see the real action on ground and let's see all actors, you know, brought back to justice. We've not seen that happen. The train event. prior to this time was a safer alternative to many commuters who of saw course, the yes, Kaduna Abuja Road Definitely. as a death trap. Yeah. What message do you think these terrorists are sending, uh, particularly when you consider that both the roads and the rails seem not to be safe? Okay, we've not really heard of anything like, you know, rail attack in the past, but they see that as an alternative because there's so much loopholes, you know, when building this rail project thing because they built, it was built, but there was no security involvement in the build up to the construction and, you know, to the delivery of the rail project. So they see that as a losing that they can actually, you know, act on and, you know, bring the real devastation they want to do, which simply means they want to make a statement. Yes, they've been able to make it, but how do we recover from it? Just like um, the news said, the trauma is still there for passengers. Anybody that wants to board this train now will start thinking and start looking again. Is it right for me or is it not right for me? Do not forget, we have the Abuja Kaduna Rail. What is happening to Lagos Ibadan as well? What have we learned so far from this one? And again, how do we put security in place? Do we now need to have a security department that actually look into traffic and you know look into um, our rails? Or do we just deploy all men in police station now again to the rail? It it's going to be like so overwhelming. It, and yes. I think we need to start mm. dividing and you know putting things in order that okay. This should cater for this. This department should cater for this. I think this is the missing link we are having, and we need to bring it completely back. That let us have transport police officers completely different from road police officers now. So, in case of this one again to happen, we need the budget and we need training to massively go into it. And equipment is so key and important, both for area view, road view, every single view we can have it. We need to do so more to make sure that, yes, passengers, customers are at rest whenever they're traveling. Beyond security, it's also a function of what strategy. Because we're hearing that there were close to some 18 policemen in the train at the time of the attack. They were outgunned. They were out of, um, you know, um, ammunition. They were overwhelmed, you know, by the gun power of, of the terrorists. So what considering for instance at this time that what kind of security strategy can we begin to deploy? I, I think tactically um, we have gallant police officers, we have gallant military men, we have gallant security officers in Nigeria, but it's such appalling that the kind of welfare given to them, the kind of protective gear given to them is nothing to write home about. I can say this authoritatively because I've been involved with them and I know so much about the kind of welfare that has been given to them. I think it's high time for the um, Police Service Commission to look into all these issues because 
I mean, let us let us bring it back home. It is not the military's problem. It is not the naval's problem. It is not the air force problem. This is a complete internal affairs that the police should be able to handle. But we've made them so powerless that they don't even know where to go. They don't even know where to run to. And the innocent ones trying to, you know, bring the good image out and not being, you know, empowered the real way. They should be empowered. So we are now seeing the result of what we've destroyed in so many months, in so many years, so many decades now playing out today. We have to go now. How optimistic are you that we have all of the resources required to return the over 100 people that have now been abducted? Back well, the strategy must be very strong. It must be very, um, they must be very proactive. And if they can do all this, as I've said, you know, bring perpetrators to justice, not just mercy or just paperwork, then we're good to go. Security expert, Fred Merato Kuali, thank you for talking to us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Meanwhile, the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, says the federal government has set into motion plans to install surveillance along train routes in Nigeria. Speaking on TV says this morning, the minister condoled with the families of those who lost their lives in the attack along the Abuja Kaduna Railway. Uh, I want to first of all use this opportunity to condole with the families of those who lost their lives in the tragic. Uh, terrorist attack on the Abuja Kaduna uh, train on Monday night. And the federal government, as Mr. President has said, has put in motion the machinery to ensure that such a thing is not repeated and that we don't witness such a thing again. One of the things the president has decided to do is to fast track the installation of an integrated surveillance and monitoring system. Officials of the Department of State Service in Ondo State have paraded a six man syndicate, including a nursing mother that specializes in kidnapping toddlers. The director of DSS in Ondosta, Jonathan Kuru, while parading the suspect, said the syndicate had been terrorizing the state for some time now. He noted that the nursing mother, who was a member of the kidnap syndicate, also helped to keep weapons for members of the group. The state deputy, Governor Lake Aedatua, while speaking of the development, assured indigents and residents of the state of adequate security of lives and property. So what you can see there, you can see them there, young men, and what is even more touching is that one of their members is a nursing mother. The six men gang that specializes in kidnapping toddlers has been terrorizing this day for a while. I've been on the watch and been trained, especially with the special crack team that was invited by the state security service. And they were able to arrest them. The Nigerian Navy has begun another operation in response to the level of crude oil theft in River State and across the Gulf of Guinea. But this time it's partnering the Nigerian National Petroleum Company to achieve its objective. The Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Awa Gamble, performed the flag off at the Navy jetty in Oné. Senior reporter Ucho Koro has details. Oil theft remains a big business in Nigeria despite concerted efforts by security agencies like the Nigerian Navy to tackle the menace. But in keeping with its promise to intensify and sustain maritime presence, the Navy has flagged off another operation codenamed Dakata da Barawo, which translates to stop the thief in English. The objective is to ensure the economic prosperity of Nigeria by stopping illegal oil bunkers who steal the nation's natural resources. Let me start by... According to the Navy, Nigeria suffers revenue losses of about $3 billion 
dollars to crude oil theft annually. There have been reports of massive theft of our of our petroleum product, uh, purportedly through the pipelines, uh, through free trading away of our product uh, by vessels, you know, and uh, uh, that has resulted in a lot of you know, bleeding of the nation. We have lost so much in terms of revenue, and from the reports we are getting, Nigeria is actually bleeding, and um, there is a need for us to bring this to a halt. This latest offensive is expected to consolidate on the achievements of Operation River Dominance that was activated in January this year to identify and dismantle artisanal refineries. The Nigerian Navy has engaged in this operation in order to first of all trace where the problem is, secondly track down those culprits that are causing this problem. The NMPC is coming in to provide technical support to the Navy. The situation we are today with the crude oil production and theft and other uh, illegal activities, which is impacting very seriously on NMPC's operations. So NMPC is really worried and reached out to the Nigerian Navy and we are ready to support the Nigerian Navy in any way we can. Operation Dakata Daparawo is scheduled to last for three months. But how much impact it would have on stabilizing the economy within that period remains to be seen. Uche Okoro, TVC News, on air. Thanks for staying with us. Let's talk health now. Nigeria's death toll from Lassa fever has risen to 127 after four more infected patients lost the battle to the disease. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control disclosed this in its latest situation report on the management of the outbreak. The Lassa virus is transmitted by infected multi rats, and humans become infected from direct contact with the urine and feces of the rat carrying the virus. It's an acute viral illness and a viral hemorrhagic fever contracted by touching soiled objects, eating contaminated food, or exposure to open cuts and sores. Away from that, today is International Mine Awareness Day and Nigeria has recorded over 10,000 casualties from explosive hazards in Borno, Adamawa and Yobe states between 2016 and 2022. This has prompted the need to create continued awareness on the dangers of landmines and other explosives. This is contained in the speech of the United Nations Humanitarian Resident Coordinator as the body commemorates the day. Moyo Thomas reports. Mine action, used as either defensive barrier or other war strategy, kills many innocent civilians. What still is that mines laid long after the wars could detonate under any trigger, posing dangers to the lives of men, women, and most especially children. This has led to the agitation to end the use of mines and create awareness on these impending dangers. To date, 164 countries, including Nigeria, have signed the Convention to End the Use of Mines and IEDs. The Nigerian government also reiterates its effort to meet this obligation, both through cleanup operations and awareness creation, as about 1.2 million people in the Northeast are in danger of being armed by explosives, with the threat now extending to other states. Of grave concern is the use of these unacceptable explosives by insurgents and other non-state actors, making Nigeria one of the eight countries with more than 100 recorded casualties in 2020. Conducted for example, IED disposal training for 26 operators of the National Police Force in Borno. Additionally, over 300 Nigeria Police Force and Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps frontline officers in Borno were trained first aid and emergency trauma bag for the benefit of National Security Services provisors. Communities about explosive ordinance. It's about making this awful system, awful explosive things to be rid of Northeast Nigeria and to make people to not to suffer anymore. Nigeria has identified the Northeast as the epic center of anti personnel mines of an improvised nature by non state armed groups 
causing internal displacement and loss of lives and properties. With the global awareness so far, over 55 million mines have been destroyed and more than 30 contaminated countries cleaned up. This non-governmental organization has also been providing prosthetics and creating awareness in the Northeast on how to avoid these fatal devices. The United Nations, in a bid to ensure no one is left behind, has called for a comprehensive response which includes assistance to survivors of explosions. Moya Thomas, TVC News, Abuja. To politics now, as the 2023 general elections draw closer, some non-governmental organizations say they are determined to change the public perception about voting in the country. To effectively do that, they have taken the message to market women, sensitizing them against vote buying and selling across the FCT. Maria Mohamed reports. Vote buying has become a disturbing feature in Nigerian elections. The federal government and INEC have tried their best to curtail this act during elections. But the efforts are usually not enough to prevent this act due to the economic situations across the country. Market women are usually the easiest target for vote buying and selling. They are left with no choice than to sell their vote for easy money. It is why this NGO has decided to go on a sensitization mission across the FCT. Their first stop was Wuye Ultramodern Market. Here we met Josephine Oba, a trader who wants the federal government to encourage women by giving them loans to develop their businesses as it will prevent them from selling their votes. There is no market you go to, you see women struggling. There are some people, they have a very good business ideas, but they don't have money, they don't have somebody to sponsor them. Other traders urge market women not to sell their votes, no matter their financial situation. Please, let us remove our hand for collecting money to vote. It's not helping us. Leaders of the NGO want women to know that when they sell their votes, they have sold their rights, and it will only benefit the politician to get to power. If they buy your vote, they are going to still pay back the money wherever they got it from. So it's time for them not to sell their vote. And the group seeks economic empowerment and political recognition for women to prevent them from selling their votes. These women in Wee Market have promised not to sell their votes come 2023 as they have decided to change the narrative. Maria Mohamed, TVC News, Abuja. And the Independent National Electoral Commission has been urged to give hope to Nigerians that the 2023 general elections will be credible by conducting free, fair, Ekiti and Osho state governorship elections in June and July this year. That was the submission of speakers at the program organized by Civil Society Committee for Anti-Fraud Election Security held in Oshobo. Rafi Hamad reports. A number of governorship candidates have emerged from different political parties ahead of July 16th governorship election in Ocean State. As usual, stakeholders in the electoral process have started performing their duties towards ensuring a credible poll. Here are members of civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, the Nigerian Union of Journalists, persons with disabilities, and the Nigerian Bar Association at the anti-fraud summit on Ocean 2022 Guba poll. If we don't take a proactive step, look, it cannot be better. If you like, go to the mosque and steal. I think Christians are fasting now, Lent season, and then the Muslims are soon, to, they have already started. And I'm telling you, by prayer alone, you can't change a nation. Keynote speakers at the event want INEC to address all the challenges associated with biometric voters' accreditation system, BIVAS. But it's not regarding, it will not be new in Oshun because it started in, in Delta, from Delta to Anambra, Anambra to LCT, LCT to Ekiti. So before you get to Oshun, it must improve. We must know the errors to ensure that Beavers experts are readily within the proximity and easily reach when there are bridges with the Beavers to avoid long delay of accreditation and voting. It's a very big challenge. They want participants to actively play their roles before and during the election. It is high time we tell INEC the plain truth that our lives depends on that election and we will take our destiny in our hands. So Beavers should work well 
and the last place to test its functionality or efficacy or efficiency or effectiveness should be equity. Civil society will no longer tolerate such impunity where people will consciously violate the law and nothing will be done. The theme of the program is the critical need for a credible ocean giver poll, a reference case for 2023 general elections. Active participation of residents is key in the July 16 governorship election in Osho State. An organizer of the program says more of it will soon be organized to sensitize the electorate on the need to perform their civic duties. Rafiul Hamid, TVC News, Ushubu. Elsewhere, Showmax has unveiled the new season of the Real Housewives of Lagos. Multichoy says this quarter promises to be exciting for their teaming viewers. Fifila Selema has more. Sophistication, elegance, these words widely describe the ambience welcoming all to the premiere of the reality show Housewives of Lagos. Success. Money. <laughs> Gold digging. <laughs> got married to a billionaire. Four people can stand there. The dress code said a cool glam, and guests at the Real House of Lagos premiere understood the assignment. Caroline Hutchins, Tony Lawani, Shema Ikoko, Miriam Timmer, and Iyabo Ojo are the five housewives featuring on the show. Like all Real Housewives franchises, we choose people that we think are going to be people who are going to bring something to the show, whether it's entertainment, whether it's drama, whether it's glitz and glamour. Uh, it's a it's an international format that that you know people people watch across the globe, um, and the choice is very much it's very specific to bring the right bunch of people. What you'll get to see on the show is these strong, powerful, uh, unique women who run their own lives as bosses. You know, you get to see the good, the bad, the in between, the pressures. You see them, no holds barred. We are Africa's most loved storyteller as multi-choice. And in keeping with that, we're, we're sort of focusing on finding our clients and customers wherever they may be. Multi-choice Africa says it plans to introduce more entertaining content that will fancy its numerous subscribers. This is the first Nigerian adaptation of the franchise, many more to come, and the third in Africa. I was asked earlier why the real house is of Lagos, and my response was why not? This is the hub. This is the hub of entertainment. Hired of this launch of this talked about um, reality show, MTN worked very, very closely with Showmax. A lot of work went down the line to make it easier and more, more, more cost effective than ever for customers to achieve very key things in three key dimensions. It has to do with women generally, how we carry ourselves, how we run our various businesses, the sacrifices we make, our families. It is so I know a lot of women will learn a lot from this. Theophilus Elama, TVC News, Lagos.